Hi, I'm uh, Sean Devlin. I'm the, uh, uh, the curator of the archaeological collections here at the Mount Vernon. Uh, and I want to thank you for joining me today for uh, doing our Friday live stream. And today, uh, hopefully, this is a treat for you all. We get to come inside. Uh, we're, we're maintaining our social distancing inside, but we are uh, letting you guys sort of see a little bit of the behind the scenes aspects of the archaeological program here at Mount Vernon. Uh, today, I wanted to kind of show you a couple of the artifacts that we found. Uh, if you were able to tune in on Monday, you saw my colleague, uh, our research archaeologist, Dr. Jason Burroughs, talk about the House for Families quarter site that was excavated up on the property. And actually, what we're going to look at today are uh, a number of artifacts that have been excavated from that site and from a number of other ones as well on the property. Um, now, what we kind of do as archaeologists, uh, folks are probably used to seeing the, the digging and the screening and the sort of the outdoor activity. Inside is equally important because there we actually look at the objects that we've recovered from outside and we begin to identify them and begin to mark patterns and understand the stories that they're actually telling us, right? Um, the material that we're collecting doing that archaeological field work is a product of the daily lives of the individuals who lived in the past. Now, those can be very famous people. Uh, folks that we all know about and, and have a, uh, a seminality to uh, our, the sort of textbooks that we learn about in American history, like George Washington. And they could also be folks um, that are less well rec represented in the documentary record, uh, like the enslaved people who lived here uh, at Mount Vernon uh, throughout uh, the Washington's uh, ownership of the property and even afterwards. Um, so to sort of maybe highlight uh, uh, the ways that we begin to use these objects to start telling those stories and to reveal uh, multiple different um, sorts of uh, stories that a single object can tell about different types of people. I, I kind of want to take today to show you a couple of the objects that we've got, sort of highlight items. And what I would really do is encourage you to uh, engage in a conversation here. Uh, I'm, I'm Maybe not the greatest lecturer. Uh, maybe I'm too good of a lecturer. I'll talk your ear off too much about one object. Uh, so I really would hope that you guys take advantage of the of the Q and A feature in the uh, in the live stream today. And I I really love to just sort of go back and forth with anybody who's out there. Um, I'll give you a sort of a, a, a tour of some of these objects, uh, sort of some idea about how we're thinking about them, how we use them to tell stories. Uh, but let me know if you want to know more about any aspect of the things I say, uh, the archaeological. Uh, more about archaeology itself or about the object itself. Uh, I will preface it by saying that uh, I will be completely honest, and if I don't know the answer, uh, I will tell you that right up front. Uh, and I'll, but I, what I can promise is that if you leave comments and questions, uh, we can do some research, talk to our many other skilled uh, and knowledgeable staff here, and come up with the answers to the questions that you guys have if I don't have them right on hand. Um, so maybe the best place to start given that we're at George Washington's Mount Vernon, is actually to highlight one of these sort of seminal objects that we've recovered archaeologically. Now this is this, um, this is actually a copper alloy trunk plate. Uh, and what you can kind of see, uh, zooming in there, is inscribed in that trunk plate is the words General Washington. Uh, so that obviously is a direct reference to George Washington. Uh, those plates, uh, based on documentary research and comparisons to objects that are actually in our fine and decorative arts collection, appear to match the ones uh, uh, that uh, were Washington paid to be manufactured and applied to trunks that he purchased in 1776 uh, uh, at the very beginning of the Revolutionary War up in Boston. These are the trunks that he carried his papers uh, you know, in the Army, uh, all the sort of uh, documents that sort of helped him uh, navigate the American Revolution and, and lead our forces to victory there. Uh, and this plate actually was on that on that one of those trunks. Um, so obviously it has a key role to sort of tell about that story, about Washington's role in the, in the revolution, his leadership role in the founding of this nation. Uh, and as you can tell, right, so it's got his name on it, so it's a fantastic object to sort of uh, highlight for folks. But if we think about this object in, in other ways as well, right, we can begin to tear apart the ways that it might tell other people's stories as well. Uh, despite having George Washington's name on the, on the plate, the man who may actually have interacted with this trunk the most is actually probably Billy Lee, Washington's enslaved um, uh, groom, who, who was with him throughout the American Revolution and uh, literally was by his side throughout the war. Um, and I think that's 
one entree point to think about the ways that sort of African Americans, particularly enslaved African Americans, made direct contributions that sometimes we may not always see directly, but that objects can begin to help us untangle uh, when we talk about the America, the founding of America, the building of America. Um, so that's sort of what I'd like to do today is, is untangle those stories a little bit more. Now, if you look sort of to the uh, to your left here, uh, this bottle that I'm actually touching with the top of my hand right now, that is a, a, a facsimile. Uh, but what I wanted to highlight is it's actually, you can see there's a round uh, piece of glass that's affixed to this wine bottle. And that's something we call a wine bottle seal. And uh, objects like that uh, were actually uh, often uh, uh, commissioned by the sort of colonial elites of the 18th century. And you can see that there are actually initials stamped into the, the sort of reproduction model. And then also in the, the three seals that were recovered archeologically in front of it, uh, those initials usually re refer to you know, a, a white planter uh, who, who you know, was expressing their wealth through uh, sort of showing off uh, their ability to, to pay for and ship over from England usually uh, these these delicate wine bottles that had their own little personalized stamps on them, right? Their own seals. Um, what's particularly uh, important about these is that clearly they are referencing those white planters, um, but we can begin to think about um, how those folks begin. Uh, we can use these objects to begin to sort of untangle uh, narratives about the enslaved population here at Mount Vernon as well. Was there a question that came through? Yeah, oh. Alex asked, what is the green bottle? Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a great question that I should have started there, I suppose. So the green bottle, uh, as I said, this is a, this is a replica. Uh, this was something that um, is, is, is fairly, fairly well done. Uh, but the green bottles like this, um, actually they would probably be a little bit more darker in color, sort of like this, this shoulder right here. Um, they're, they're called wine bottles. Uh, so we, they're one of the most common archaeological recovered objects, um, domestic sites, even on work sites. Um, obviously, they are referred to as wine bottles, so they did contain alcohol at various points. Um, but a, a more important thing to sort of keep in mind is that, that this doesn't just mean that wine was all over the place. <laughs> Actually, these bottles were sort of, if we want to think about them in modern terms, they might be uh, sort of a Tupperware container or a or the uh, camelback of the day, right? So if you could you could store lots of liquids in there, they, do, they needed to be alcoholic. Um, you could store water in something like that. You could store uh, beers or ciders or other sort of objects. So that's part of the reason that we find so many of them uh, across different sites. Um, but for those those elite planners that I was just talking about, the people who are commissioning and paying for these seals, um, they usually are sort of ex you know holding an alcoholic beverage that maybe is being a gift to a fellow planter, et cetera. Right. It's again. It's sort of this this marker, sort of showing off uh, to to uh, other members of society, sort of your own wealth and status, right? And of course, a lot of that wealth and status uh, in colonial Virginia was accrued through uh, owning enslaved individuals and appropriating their labor to make money, right? Um, part of the reason we have these particular seals out is because they all play a central role in helping us define the different. Uh, status of enslaved people here at Mount Vernon. Right there in the center, we have an AW. That stands for Augustine Washington. That's actually George's father. Uh, that seal was recovered uh, actually in the 1930s uh, from the east slope of the, of the house. Um, so looking towards Potomac, just going down to the river there. Um, we have that out and that's a, a useful way to sort of uh, begin to dive into this story about the fact that enslaved individuals here at Mount Vernon, particularly by 1799, were in different groups. And my colleague Jason Burroughs talked about this quite well on Monday. Um, but in essence, one of those groups was individuals that was inherited by George through his family, right? So through his father, and then later through his elder half-brother who passed away and left uh, some of his estate to George. Uh, other individuals were purchased by George Washington over the course of his lifetime, right? Uh, so, for example, this uh, seal to your right, I guess, uh, is uh, by uh, of a man named John Posey. Posey was a neighbor uh, here uh, in the Mount Vernon area, particularly when uh, George was a young bachelor who had moved to Mount Vernon. Uh, and George subsequently over the next decades 
purchased quite a bit of land from Posey and actually formed the greater five farms in Mount Vernon and some of that property. But he also purchased individuals. Um, so Posey actually sold a man named Hercules, who would go on to become George Washington's presidential chef uh, and sort of the, the famous figure uh, that we, we, we know and see in a lot of museum displays. Uh, and actually, uh, what was interesting is our colleagues over on the decorative arts side and, and in the library side uh, have recently sort of been able to make some connections and Hercules actually escaped from George Washington's Mount Vernon um, towards the end of the uh, 18th century. Uh, we knew that, and he, we knew that he had never been found afterwards, but uh, we didn't quite know what had happened to him. Uh, recently, some documents have been connected, and uh, we believe that uh, uh, Hercules actually moved to New York and lived there. Uh, and what's interesting is he was living under the name of Hercules Posey. Uh, so there are some really interesting ways to sort of connect, even though we're talking about a white planter's sort of socially uh, show-off symbol, right, that we are connecting to these other folks through interesting and they're opening up ways to sort of think about them and how they came to Mount Vernon. It looks like there's another question. Yeah, Anne asked, have you found any items that you could attribute specifically to someone other than the Washingtons? Other than, yes. So that's, so we've got the Posey. Um, part of the problem that we have as archeologists is that uh, very few people actually wrote their names on, on the objects they use in daily life, right? Sort of think about the spoons and the breakfast bowls that you use, right? Um, even your clothing, maybe you write your name, uh, your kid's name in their clothing, but um, right, we, the materials that we get usually are not able to be associated with a specific individual. Oftentimes what we can do though is begin to associate with specific groups, right? So um, when we talk about the House for Families quarter site, part of what makes that so special is it was a cellar that was uh, sealed and capped in 1792-93 and the only people who were living in that building that put trash into that, that, that cellar before it was sealed were enslaved African Americans who were owned by the Washingtons here at Mount Vernon. Um, now, we can't assign that to specific individuals, but what you're really raising is the way that we can use objects, I think, to not definitively say someone, uh, some specific person used this, right? But we can maybe tie objects that sort of speak to tasks or to um, things that people might have owned and tie, and tie them into those document, fleeting documentary references that we might have to individuals. So one example of that that I, I've often used is, uh, you can see a played out a chisel here, right? Um, I'll, we'll sort of leave the discussion of wine bottle seals and talk more about this notion about how Mount Vernon was, uh, how in, enslaved lives were incredibly integrated into sort of creating the fabric of Mount Vernon, right? We can probably, we all probably often know about the notion about labor, growing tobacco and wheat and sort of the ways that that labor generated cash for these uh, plantation owners. But one of the other things we can talk about is literally this place was built with enslaved labor and sort of managed uh, by enslaved people using skill crafts too, right? And sort of recognizing the contribution that makes to sort of making this place a truly unique and special place. Uh, so this chisel that I just referenced we don't know who used it. We recovered it from the blacksmith shop. Uh, it's a particular, it appears to be a particular kind of chisel called a firmer chisel. Uh, that might have been used by someone labeled as a carpenter, someone doing sort of rough work, or it might have been used by someone who's a joiner, uh, who does uh, more detailed work. Um, a lot of times at Mount Vernon, joiners were indentured whites uh, or freed whites. Um, Carpenters may more often, we, we have a number of references to enslaved carpenters here at Mount Vernon who are doing a lot of labor. Um, so when we have an object like this chisel, right, we do use it as a way to sort of talk about who are the people who are using it, right, uh, and open up those stories. Um, so there are a number of enslaved uh, men uh, operating at Mount Vernon, uh, a man named Sam Anderson, uh, Washington had a, a sort of head carpenter, a man who oversaw uh, five to seven other enslaved individuals doing carpentry work, a man named Isaac. Uh, eventually there was a man named Christopher Shields who did carpentry for a little bit before he eventually became Washington's sort of uh, trusted groom, sort of, uh, groom uh, in, in, in later life. Um, so there are these folks who are doing that uh, here who are enslaved and we have documentary references to. And a lot of the work that they're doing, right, is uh, 
they might not always be working on the mansion, uh, those expansions to mansions that we talked about, but they were essential for creating the fences, uh, doing the uh, cre creating the outbuildings, constructing quarters for other enslaved individuals. Um, they were really right, sort of vital for the the continued operation of Mount Vernon as a place that that continued to produce wealth for Washington, and they were doing that through sort of uh, skilled work that they they had. Uh, that they had learned. Right, another question. Yeah, um, Scarlett asks, what are some techniques or methods used to determine the date of objects found on the estate? That's great. Um, that's really fantastic, actually. Mm -hmm. um, one of the best objects we have for dating, uh, of course, there are things like coins, etc., uh, things that might actually have a, a mint date on them. Um, but one of the best objects we have for dating is actually ceramics. Um, Ceramics were sort of a very style, stylish object at the time. Um, a lot of uh, ceramics were actually produced in England and in Europe. Uh, and in this sort of second half of the 18th century, uh, the English potters basically discovered the idea that if you change your product a little bit, uh, you can make it the newest, latest thing and force people to buy new sets once again, right? Um, we were still uh, in that, in that uh, sphere of fashionability and expressing fashionability through current trends. Uh, so over here, actually, we have a selection of different ceramics that we use to tell some of the time story. Um, this object directly at the top is something called Delft ware. Uh, it traditionally is uh, uh, sort of used as sort of a, a plate and sort of tablewares, um, uh, mugs, those types of things. Um, and Generally, it was used as a fashionable item in the beginning of the 18th century. It's really by the, by the 1740s, 1730s, 1740s, it begins to fall out of fashion as the most uh, fashionable object. And English potters began producing this material called white salt glaze stoneware here, which you can see, which is really uh, interesting because of the changes to the clay and the way that they're firing these uh, products that they're making. You can see the way that those objects are highly decorated with sort of molded decorative relief. Now the object that you guys are probably seeing on your left hand side is something that we call dot diaper basket weave. Uh, if you see the little X's and the dots in the, um, in the center of them on one side there, that's actually a, a pattern that we see uh, basically at every site, every archeological excavation we do here at Mount Vernon. And actually Washington uh, purchased uh, 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 entire table settings of this material uh, when, he, when he came to Mount Vernon uh, and, uh, and just before his marriage to uh, Martha. Uh, what you can see in the second object there, though, is a slightly different pattern uh, that we call a barley, uh, a barley pattern. It's got sort of a teardrop shape inside some wavy lines. Uh, that's actually, they're contemporaneous. There's not really a time difference between those two different types. Um, but what we might be seeing there is some variation. Since we see very little of the barley pattern, what we might actually be seeing is someone purchasing white salt glaze stoneware here who isn't Washington, who isn't purchasing it in a big bulk order where it's all going to be relatively similar because it's shipped over from England in one shipment. Um, so what we might actually be seeing here is some variation in terms of people on the estate buying different uh, objects, right? And Primarily the folks here uh, who might be doing that uh, might be indentured whites, might be free whites, but there are a lot more enslaved African Americans uh, here as well. So perhaps some, some variability there. There are later ceramics that, that uh, also come up. Uh, so we see this creamware and this pearlware, and they move us through time because we know exactly when they're invented. Um, and that's, we, we sort of do a lot of statistical analysis to figure out how many of these different types and when were they made to sort of come up with dates. Uh, and that, that's one of the most useful ways we know how to date uh, archaeological context is through these hard bits that sort of stay there in the ground. Looks like there's another question. Yeah, Cynthia said, um, when you find a tiny fragment of something, say a piece of porcelain, and almost, for instance, almost too minute to identify, how best do you identify it to discover its providence and history? That's great. Um, well, so what you're actually looking at on this day, these are really great questions. Thank you. <laughs> I, 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 I had some ideas, but these are, you know, we're going to, we're going to delve right into these. So you can see, actually, if you look at maybe uh, if you're able to zoom in on the porcelain plate here, this is a porcelain plate, as a matter of fact, Chinese export porcelain. You can see those little cracks running through it. 
those are actually each individual uh, sherds, we call them, the little broken bits of the, of the plates, the original plate that we've recovered archaeologically. And actually, we've had volunteers and staff members over the years mend these back together, use uh, a museum quality glue that sort of we can reverse, et cetera. Uh, but we, we actually put these objects back together from the little bits we've recovered archaeologically. Now, that's, as you can imagine, a very labor intensive and very, um, it may not always pay off, right? You may have <laughs> one piece that came from somewhere that's just not going to bend to anything else. Uh, but the fact that we have these objects here, that we've spent that labor on creating uh, or reconstructing these plates or these jugs or these cups means that when we have new excavations and we do have those really small pieces that you're just talking about, um, myself and, and other staff members who have done cataloging over the years here uh, can actually take that small piece and literally hold it up against these, these more complete examples and look at the curvature, look at the, uh, of the rim, look at the, the curve of the sort of well of the plate here, understand sort of what are the foot rings, right? These sort of raised bits that actually sit on the table. What do those look like on plates versus on bowls versus on teacups? Um, and, and so we actually physically can take these objects and compare them. And that's really what uh, we do in part of this space is um, we're not here just gluing these objects back together. We actually, the vast majority of my work is, is taking the individual artifacts and cataloging them, putting them in an electronic database so they begin to interrogate them and think about them in a broader context. So it's not just dealing with one small piece that we might not be able to say that much about, but by aggregating those, that's how we begin to say, these are the types of plates that were available to individuals in the house or families. Uh, these are maybe how those plates are similar or different than plates that were available in the mansion house. Right? Um, so that, that's some of the work we do here as well. That's a great question. Yeah, we've got another good question from Kimberly. She asks, where do you start on researching an item? <laughs> <laughs> um, some of it, it comes from experience. Uh, everybody, I should say, has their own particular specialties. Um, mm -hmm. Personally, I, I enjoy looking at ceramics, uh, I think because they're a little bit clearer. <laughs> they're easy to wash, they're hard, they last, they, they don't um, corrode as much. Uh, but there, there are other archeologists who specialize in um, iron objects, right? Uh, think about uh, sort of the corrosion you might see on a rusty object out there in the world. Well, imagine that it was buried and, and sort of really corroded. So there are archeologists who um, are specialists in x-ray uh, photography to sort of see underneath those layers of rust. There are folks who do conservation on those objects to uh, remove the rust and get out the core that's still there. That's sort of what happened with the chisel. You can see that that looks very, it doesn't necessarily look new, but it looks very clean. That's been conserved and, and that's how we learned some of the information we did learn about it. Um, there are other folks who are specialized and I'm not one of these specialists, but uh, I benefit from their knowledge. Uh, there are folks who specialize in um, what we call faunal analysis, which is basically the, the bones and material that's left from animals in the past. Now, a lot of that analysis has to do with diet, right? Because that's how a lot of humans interact with, with animals, right? As we eat them. Um, so these are actually uh, an assemblage of material that has come from a couple of different sites, but is representative of the types of material we see at the house for families and, and at other sites as well here. Um, but we have everything from shellfish that might be uh, uh, pulled from the river. We have aquatic fish. Um, uh, well, that's sort of an oxymoron. There isn't an aquatic fish, but you, you, uh, we have fish here. Uh, so I believe out uh, just in front of you, I believe we have a, a bass. Uh, those are dentary or teeth, right? So that's the jaw. Above that, we have a catfish uh, jaw. Uh, we also have a wide variety of uh, what these folks can do is look at these small bones and actually tell wild animals from domesticated animals, right? So just above the uh, catfish is a, actually a, a humerus, I believe, of a duck, if I'm remembering my artifacts that I laid out correctly. Mm -hmm. But just on the uh, right-hand side, we actually have a whole series of domesticated animals. So we have a portion of a cow bone at the top, that large sort of knee-looking object. Um, just below that, the other bone that's out of the box is a pig scapula, so a, a shoulder blade. Next to that is the skull of a chicken. Uh, below that, uh, and this always amazed me when I first started archaeology, but those are actually eggshell fragments. So archaeologists can find things as delicate as eggshell if we use the appropriate techniques and we know what to look for. Um, so again, you can see, right, we've got a wide variety of stuff here. Now, how do we 
begin to tie that into a broader narrative, right? If we think about this as coming from sites, uh, as I said, if this is representative of the House for Families, what we can see is that folks who are living there, who are eating food, are drawing off a wide range of different uh, animals that they can access to sort of supplement their diets, right? So fish uh, may be a byproduct of enslaved individuals who Washington has sent out to catch herring. Uh, he also supplied herring to his enslaved population as well as part of their diet. But things like the catfish, there are uh, individuals that we have records of that go out and actually do fishing for Washington. They maybe catch fish for themselves, but also sell it to Washington as well. Um, hunting for duck and for deer as well. We have a, a deer bone as well at the top that I didn't mention. It's something that we know individuals did. Um, the man Sam Anderson that I just referenced before is uh, a part as doing some carpentry work here at Mount Vernon, and my colleague Jason Burroughs also talked about last week, we know that he was out hunting uh, on Mount Vernon's property for animals in it. Uh, he raised uh, honeybees uh, and, and grew honey. Lots of other enslaved individuals uh, know this very quite a bit depending on the different plantations and the plantation owners, right? Because they're the ones who actually regulated what enslaved individuals could do. But here in Mount Vernon, uh, folks were given access to uh, what we call provision grounds, so small garden plots, where in their off time, right, Not they weren't given time just to do this, but in their off time, they could cultivate crops. Um, they could, they might, they weren't allowed to own large animals, but they could own chickens and raise chickens for the eggs and for the meat. Um, things like cattle and pigs and uh, sheep, even here in Mount Vernon, might have been provisioned by Washington to the enslaved population to provide meat to that diet. Uh, obviously, he also uh, would provide grains, usually in the form of cornmeal, uh, maybe things like buttermilk, things like that. Um, what I can do, too, is sort of, we're, we're probably free-flowing here. We'll kind of uh, float back and forth a little bit. Talking about buttermilk actually raises to me again sort of that notion about what kinds of work are people doing here, uh, enslaved individuals doing here to help support, um, the, uh, to, to sort of keep this place running, right? And one of those uh, tasks is dairying. Uh, to get that buttermilk, to make cream, and to, to have dairy products available uh, you know, for the mansion, for sale, and also for the enslaved population here. So what we see here, this red object, this sort of shallow uh, bowl almost looking thing, is actually called a milk pan. Uh, so it's a very specific form in which um, milk would be allowed to sit in that and allowed to separate. Um, and that, that would be sort of the process of separating the cream and the buttermilk. Uh, obviously for processing further on. Enslaved women, uh, like folks named Kitty, uh, would have done that in the kitchen area, would have done that potentially on, on the outlying farms as well. Um, the other great thing about the sort of milk pan is it's obviously got a very specific function that I just referenced, uh, but we can see that Washington orders, uh, we, we can see the orders that Washington places to, to uh, his merchants in London where he's actually calling out how many he wants of these types of objects. And he's literally ordering hundreds of these, right? Um, so he's processing a lot of milk, but these are probably also sort of utilitarian vessels inside the kitchen, right? Um, so other folks, aside from just dairy maids, folks like Dahl, uh, who's sort of the, the, the sort of matriarch of the kitchen here at Mount Vernon, uh, very uh, early on in, in the Washington's life here, probably was using these objects and, and sort of you would have seen the kitchen sort of covered in them. But it looked like we had another question as well, so I'd be more than happy to, to, to answer that. Thanks, John. So Becky asks, what's the most unexpected find so far at that site? Ooh, um, that is a great question. Um, <laughs> I think one of the, so some of the objects, maybe we come over here, um, maybe not so much unexpected uh, to archaeologists. And I don't mean that in a, in a uh, 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 condescending <laughs> way, uh, but at House for Families, now this is actually, uh, the object I'm talking about is actually on display in the museum right now, uh, but I have a comparable object here. This is actually uh, a portion of a silver Spanish coin that has been cut. Um, now this is a very delicate conversation. We want to make sure that people actually understand, right, sort of uh, um, the realities of that historical circumstance. But at, Mount, at the House for Families, we actually did find some cash, right, in the, in the refuse of the House for Families which probably these small cut coins may have actually fallen out of someone's pocket or through the floor plates, et cetera. But it does mean that enslaved individuals did have some access to cash, right? 
But just a second ago, I talked about uh, Sam Anderson and a couple of other individuals who were able to sell things like doll sold chickens to Washington, for example. Um, folks were able to get some cash. Um, now that doesn't, by any means, paint a rosy picture of their lives, right? Uh, but but it does show their entrepreneurial spirit and the way that they were uh, sort of accruing for themselves and, and taking on the ability to sort of uh, like gain gain some access to making, having cash to make their own choices about what they might want to purchase. Uh, and that actually did happen, right? Uh, so enslaved women, not just here in Mount Vernon, but in uh, sort of throughout the South actually undergirded um, colonial markets, uh, so market towns, places like Alexandria and other regional towns actually are where enslaved individuals could go on Sunday and actually market some of the goods that they might have grown in that garden crop that they didn't eat as their family. It gave them a small revenue source and a way to sort of uh, begin to get a little bit of agency over their own lives, right? And I think that's a really powerful uh, notion. So I think that's something that's unexpected to most folks when they're thinking about enslaved lives. Um, again, I, it's a complex story, though, and you want to make sure that you're not uh, sort of over-interpreting that and thinking that, that, that life is, uh, uh, that people have ready access to, to lots of money. Uh, but it is an important point to raise that enslaved business people, which is what these folks were to some degree, and putting in modern terms, they really did undergird those those early town markets. They were an incredibly important uh, point, not just for the plantation, making the plantations viable, but for making these towns viable by bringing food there, by being consumers in those stores. Um, so that that would be an unexpected find, I think, for me. Yeah, another question? We do, yeah. We have a question from Vicki. She asks, would you recommend for someone looking to go into an archaeology, or what would you recommend for someone looking to go into an archaeology career? And are there certain classes or things we can do to better our knowledge in the field? That's a, another great. You guys, are, I, you guys get to write the next <laughs> script for any one of these that I do again. Um, there are certain career paths. Uh, so, and, and I'm not going to lie, most of them go through schools. Uh, so um, for someone who, is at, who wants to be a professional archaeologist, you, you, it's the same as any other field, basically. You, you want to go to school, you want to look at anthropology, basically, um, and uh, maybe you need to go get a master's degree, maybe you need to go get a PhD like some of our colleagues here. Um, there is a, a whole field of archaeologists that don't work at places like museums or in universities. Uh, there's national legislation that uh, has been passed since the uh, late 60s and 70s that deals with um, sort of preserving uh, uh, cultural resources, what we call them, archaeological sites and historic buildings and traditional places that uh, for native groups or other groups uh, that traditionally use spaces. Um, and that's all part of our federal regulation process. So there is an entire private sphere as well if you want to be a practicing archaeologist. Um, you can actually go and work for a company that does survey work, does research. They do all the same types of things we do here. Um, they just don't always get to present it to the public all the time. Um, I'll not lie, a lot of folks tend to move around among those different spheres. So uh, that, that, in terms of professionals, that's professionalization, that's what most folks, sort of the paths they take. Um, just for sort of knowledge, though, I think uh, there's all sorts of books you can read. Um, what's actually been most uh, interesting to me uh, uh, is that sort of, I think when we think of archaeology, sometimes we think about, um, we, well, some people might think of dinosaurs, uh, <laughs> so, but other people may think of things like Romans or, um, you know, sort of deep past types of things. Uh, here in Mount Vernon, uh, we do deal with some uh, aspects of sort of deep time. Uh, so we deal with Native American communities that lived here in Mount Vernon well before the Washingtons were here. Uh, but by and large, we are specialists in what's called historical archaeology, where we, we blend the fields of history and archaeology um, to sort of draw on different strands of evidence. Uh, and, and part of that is to make our conclusions stronger, right? Uh, so when we talk about the lives of folks who lived at the house or families, um, when I'm speaking, a lot of that will be driven by objects. Um, it will also be driven by what we can see in the ground. Uh, but it will be uh, supplanted and strength, or not supplanted, uh, uh, supplemented and, and strengthened by these documentary references that I'm talking about, right? Sort of the, the sale of goods to Washington or to other folks. 
Um, so, you know, there is a subfield called historical archaeology. If you're really interested in this, look up that topic on Amazon or uh, other things. I could probably also leave uh, some in the comments, maybe some texts that are really great introductions to this field. Um, there's a man named Jim Dietz who wrote sort of the, and I, I, don't, I swear I'm not getting paid for this. Um, <laughs> he wrote a sort of seminal text that every college student who takes an archaeology, historical archaeology class has to read. It's called In Small Things Forgotten. Um, I think that's a great introduction to thinking about some of the ideas that we've sort of been discussing a little bit here today about how do objects and, and um, past individuals, how do they use them, how do they reflect social um, organization, social uh, norms and social interactions. Um, so I would recommend that book. If you're looking for one text, go ahead and read that one, and I'll lead you to a lot of other ones. Maybe we can also add some other ones as well. And we have another question. Another question? Yeah, yeah, from Kathleen. She said, I heard that former outhouses were great places to find items. Have you had success with ones at Mount Vernon? <laughs> well, my, uh, my esteemed colleague, uh, uh, Jason Burles, uh, actually just came in, but I, I won't put him on there. <laughs> uh, that is true. A lot of, a lot of uh, outhouses, privies, tend to be deep, deep dug uh, uh, holes, um, and, and trash ends up in them. When they, usually when they're sort of stop being used, people need to fill in that deep hole and that's just a convenient place to put trash. Um, here at Mount Vernon, most of the privies that we've seen are actually uh, raised up and even the one that was excavated on the east lawn looks like it had a, a, a height differential so material may have actually been brought out from underneath sort of a, a sort of hollow space underneath the, without getting too gross, uh, <laughs> underneath the privy as opposed to sort of going down into a pit below it. Um, so not, not the same thing here at Mount Vernon. But certainly that is that is um, an area that people find a lot of material. Uh, and because usually those are capped with a good date, maybe like a house sort of stops being occupied, it's great for archaeologists as well, because it's nice to know, you know, these objects, you know, came from this household, um, came from this from before this time period. Um, because as archaeologists we tend to deal in in uh, sometimes in decades as opposed to single years. Um, though we sometimes we can be really lucky to get those single <laughs> years. Is there another question? Yeah, Elizabeth said, uh, does Mount Vernon keep objects from found from the time after George and Martha Washington lived in Mount Vernon? We do. Um, and that's actually, that's a, another great question. Um, you know, we've sort of set out today, I wanted to sort of talk a little bit about that sort of 18th century enslaved uh, life experience here. Uh, sort of building on some of the, the, the other talks we've seen over the course of the last several months. Uh, but Mount Vernon's archeology span program does pay attention to the entire length of human occupation here. So earlier I referenced Native American communities. We have, we have uh, literally objects that date back you know, uh, thousands of years here. Um, uh, we have settlements that, that um, uh, start in the colonial period and extend all through the 18th century, but you know, Mount Vernon didn't end with the death of George and Martha. Uh, we have uh, material that dates to the 19th century by the people who actually inherited it and lived here as well. And the enslaved population that was uh, brought here by those folks as well. Um, so there are sites in the vineyard where we think maybe there might actually be um, cabins that were excavated, uh, that we, we have material associated with other populations of enslaved folks in a later period. Some of the quarter farms that we might be looking at in the future also ex probably extend a little bit later. Um, most interesting to most folks, though, is that we even have objects that date to the 20th century. Right, to that period of Mount Vernon as museum, and that really reflect that. Um, so I, I didn't lay them out on the table today, uh, but we find everything from brownie rings and, and Girl Scout pins and Boy Scout, International Boy Scout uh, pins, uh, to uh, tokens for the old electric trolley that used to be where the George Washington Parkway is now. Uh, when people were coming down from Alexandria to visit Mount Vernon uh, on that old trolley line in the early 20th century. So yeah, we really do try and cover the entire breadth of human occupation here at Mount Vernon through the archaeology program. And another question? I yeah, saying, well, I think we're just going to keep going with questions. Oh, yeah, that, that sounds great. Yeah, <laughs> we yeah, got a lot. Um, Kimberly said, "How often do you think an item? How often do you think an item used one way only to discover later that it was a completely oh, different way?" That's great. Um, I, I couldn't put a, a quantifiable number on that. Um, <laughs> But I think that is, you sort of really put your uh, finger on one of the key 
issues in archaeology. Um, I, I had a friend who, uh, remember when I was talking about, you, know, you have to go to graduate school to some degree when you want to do some of these things. They were in an archaeological, I, I swear this is going to go somewhere fun. Uh, they were in an archaeological theory class and they were arguing with their professor that you could always, you know, a cup was a cup, right? You could, uh, you put a, you literally had a cup and you straightened it out and you slammed it down the table, poured water in it and said it was a cup. You know, you, you, know, you couldn't do anything else with it. The kid being a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, uh, talking back a little bit much, but he took his <laughs> keys out and threw them in the cup and said, "There, now it's a key holder." Right? <laughs> you you cannot really always know exactly the full diversity of how people are going to engage with material culture, with with stuff, how they're going to use it, how they're going to think about it, what it means to them on an individual level. Um, so that is something that is really hard for us. Sometimes documents help with that. Um, so maybe if we're lucky, we have sort of journals, uh, maybe from individuals themselves who are talking about objects and how they use them. Maybe they're from, in the case of plantations, I'll not lie, when we're talking about enslaved lives, a lot of times that documentation tends to be a white visitor or a plantation owner commenting on enslaved individuals and how they're using material. That, we have to begin to then untangle all the complexities of what that means, uh, how that person viewing objects. Um, so that's one venue we can start to get at ideas. Another one is, as I sort of talked about before, this notion about um, taking, you know, sort of things as buried as statistics or chemical analysis, and uh, you know, maybe a journal entry, maybe um, uh, sort of basic understandings of forms over time and commonality, and we begin to wind those different bits of evidence together. So we may not be able to say everyone who used this object thought of it this way, right? But if a bunch of those pieces of evidence are all honing in in a similar direction, we may be able to make statements about, you know, sort of larger groups of people, right? Um, or be able to sort of help think about how is this normally used in uh, most, most often, I shouldn't say normally, how is it most often sort of used and what were the connotations it may have had to a broader range of people in the past? Um, so that's a, really, that's a fantastic and really deep question. Uh, you should be going to graduate school. <laughs> so um, Donna asked, did the Washingtons provide any household items for the enslaved people, cookware, dishes, furniture, et cetera? That is another great question. Um, so remember, if you were here earlier in the, in the stream, I maybe a little bit awkwardly was pointing out this, this white soft lace stoneware and pointing out these two different patterns, right? Um, the reality is it seems almost certain that um, some of the items that uh, enslaved individuals had here were probably purchased you know, by the Washington. Certainly some of the, the work objects, right? Um, those milk pans that I talked about in terms of daring, the chisels, et cetera, right? Those were ordered from London and shipped to America and Washington paid for them. Obviously though, with the express purpose of enslaved laborers doing the work to actually make those things productive. Um, Knowing about individual objects is a little bit more hard. We don't have as much sort of documentary evidence sort of suggesting that Washington's furnishing anything by any means. Um, and that, that would be extremely rare, uh, uh, if at all, uh, in sort of that period. Um, what we can see is going back to these ceramics is that, you know, objects like this sort of dot diaper basket weave that I sort of talked about is Washington probably ordered this as a large table setting. Uh, right around when he met Martha Washington. Subsequently, English potters came out with the newest, latest ceramics, and that was this thing called creamware. Uh, here we can see that. And that, roughly about a decade later, Washington purchased another table setting of that, and he continued to buy this for, for years, as well as having a more fine dining Chinese porcelain set. So by the time creamware came around, it's possible that, you know, this sort of slightly less stylish, out of fashion, white salt glaze. Maybe the reason we're seeing it all over the estate is because it is being disseminated out to populations, you know, the enslaved population. Um, but I, as I said too, I think there is some real possibility of us sort of looking at objects um, and seeing that, you know, enslaved people may have had some purchasing power, may have chosen their own objects. Uh, this is a, sort of a, a little bit of a, 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 a cheat here, because I, I don't know who, who, we cannot know who owned this teacup here. This is actually the last type of ceramic that sort of came out. It actually came out 
during the Revolutionary War, 1779. Uh, it's, it's pearlware. Um, as far as we know, Washington didn't purchase that himself as sort of a big table setting, certainly at least. Um, here you can see it's got kind of a bluish tint as opposed to the sort of creaminess of the paintwork. Um, but we do find it here. We find some in the Hauser family's quarter. We find it, uh, that's this teacup is actually from the distillery where there were free whites and enslaved Africans working and living. Um, we find it in other locations on the property as well. Uh, there, it might be, you know, might be an indication of that. It could also be an indication of time, like we going all the way back to the beginning of the question. Uh, since this is a later object that continues into the 19th century, a later type of ceramic, uh, it could also be that we're seeing those 19th century post-Washington populations here as well. Uh, so they leave their mark on the landscape as well. Um, yeah, so that, that, that's sort of, uh, I, I think, kind of where I wanted to go with that particular answer. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah, questions? we do. We have time for just a couple more. One second. No <laughs> um, we have a question. Is there a way to participate in archaeological work at Mount Vernon as a volunteer? There is. Um, but at the moment, obviously, we're all mm -hmm. uh, trying to stay safe and, and protect each other. Uh, so it's a little bit more complicated right now in the, in the, in the immediate moment. Um, but traditionally, uh, we do have uh, volunteers come out and help us with uh, a few select projects where staff can supervise them and, and help them learn how to excavate and do work. Um, we've had a very robust volunteer program here in the lab. Um, folks help us, you know, these shiny objects, uh, even though they're broken that are on the table, they, they look a lot different than they did when they came out of the ground. And it takes a lot of work to get them into the state. And, and volunteers have been critical to that uh, for us here at Mount Vernon, as well as the broader volunteer mission at Mount Vernon. So here in archeology, span uh, we really have traditionally depended on, on volunteers to come out and help us. We hope uh, that we get to give a little bit of learning and experience back to them. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, you know, pay attention to that volunteer website at Mount Vernon. I'm sure they'll have some information about how that program's gonna uh, come back uh, as we all sort of get past this moment in time. And then our last question, um, what is your favorite find? <laughs> uh, my cheating answer, cheating, my favorite answer uh, to this, uh, though it's completely cheaty, is that I did meet my wife on archaeology site, so I'll, I'll, I have to say that. Um, I know it's it's hard to to label a specific individual favorite. I think, um, in part because I think part of what it is is that it's actually when you take the objects as a whole, they begin to get a more complete story. Uh, but what I will say is what's been most amazing to me over the course of the last uh, four years when I've had this job here is the ways that um, when you actually pay attention to it, when you look at the details, when you begin to do research, when you begin to look at even the most humble objects, so something as small as a little broken piece of window pane, right, window glass or nails or something like that, they all have a very rich story to tell, right? Um, we had an intern in here um, a year and a half ago about, and um, she actually helped us do some work with the chisel object that I showed you before. And as sort of the side second project, she actually was looking at window glass. And, you know, to be honest, I, she, we did the chisel and it was like, okay, this will be a good one. She just saw the window glass and was like, oh, I'd be interested to look into that. And I personally was like, you're not going to find it. It's not going to be that interesting. Uh, she came back uh, at the end of the term and she had you know, a, a research portfolio like this thick on, on sort of window glass and and the different types of manufacturing of window glass, the, um, the different tax laws that were in uh, in, uh, in in place in the in the colonial period. Um, so you know, even something as humble as a tiny tiny uh, piece of glass can can really open up a whole story. It's really about the attention you pay to it. It's about the, the willingness you have to sort of explore and and see connections as well. That's part of what I think archaeology does really well is that it, uh, it forces us to look small and then begin to reach, uh, reach back out to tell a, a broader story. Um, whether that's about individuals in the past, whether that that's a, a broader story about societal change, um, if it's about a historical moment, um, you know, it really does uh, provide a, an avenue to sort of branch out, look at historical documents, look at 
at scientific data, um, look at uh, all sorts of things. So, uh, yeah, I, th I think my favorite is all of them, uh, <laughs> if that counts. And, and I've been surprised at how amazing each individual object, no matter how um, seemingly unimportant it might be, can actually be, how rich and, and detailed that story can actually be. Thank you for joining us today, Sean. No, thank you, guys. Thanks very much for uh, listening. The questions were fantastic. They really, uh, really enjoyed that. Um, I know the next week there's going to be a, another Friday live stream on Juneteenth where you'll get to hear from some of our uh, other colleagues who have done a lot of work uh, both on the museum exhibit and on uh, character interpretation here at Mount Vernon talking about enslaved lives. So I, I hope you'll join my colleagues for that next week and um, I hope you'll come here at Mount Vernon and we'll see you soon when, uh, when everybody's ready. Have a good rest of the day.